So I just want to welcome everyone to the Military Family Services United States second guest speaker of the summer, Jackie Hollywood Brown, who is joining us from Texas. And I'm not going to say too much about her because she has a, a bit to share about herself. And But we're so happy to have her. She is truly a professional professional at what she does and uh, is, is going to give you a great presentation today about how to organize, specifically for military families, because Lord knows that we have a greater challenge because of our frequent moves. How do we keep all of our things organized and in place and ready to go uh, for the very frequent moves that we have? Um, and she knows a little bit about that because she is, after one year, moving again. So she knows exactly what she's talking about. So before we get started today, I do have to read this short disclaimer to you. MFS US does not endorse any outside person, company, agency, or association. If you choose to engage with the representative from today's presentation, you do so with the understanding that you are responsible for all interactions and actions. And then before we get started, for those of you who've never been to our WebEx classroom, which is where we're meeting today, it's a virtual classroom, there are some cool tools that you can use throughout today's presentation. And I'm going to turn off my video camera at this point. Please do not, you do not need to turn on your video camera for today's presentation. Um, we, we keep it low key, that way you don't have to worry about people watching you throughout the presentation. But I'm going to turn off mine now and we're just going to talk about some of the tools that you can use in today's classroom. And that also closes the box on your screen as well so that you can hopefully see both the participant panel on the right hand side and the chat panel. So on the slide that I have here, I actually broke out pictures of this of the classroom to point to them so you can see some of the tools. So over here on the right hand side of the screen, you see the participants panel where you see all of your names listed. So here's just a picture of it, which gives me a little bit ease of use. I think everyone has already found the mute button. So it's a toggle like everything else in the classroom. And a toggle just means that you click on it once to mute yourself. And if you want to unmute yourself to talk, you just click on it again. Below the participants panel, you're going to find a little emoji or emoticon toolbar. And so again, I popped out a big picture of it to show you. And so if you want to raise your hand during the presentation to ask a question or during the question and answer times that Jackie offers throughout, you can just click on the, the button one time to raise your hand. And if you want to go ahead and give that a try, just to give it a test, you'll see the hand come up to the right of your name. So you can see that I've got my hand raised, MFS US, and you can see Tammy's got hers, and there we go, everybody's sort of finding it. And then to the right of that is the yes and no. So if Jackie asks a yes or no question, so for example, who here um, finds that it is a struggle to keep their kids' toys organized? Give me a green check if yes or a red X for no. I don't have kids, but I will say that sometimes my dog is like a toddler and I come home and there's toys strewn everywhere. All right, excellent. So you see that very easily you just click yes, green, Green check for yes, red X for no, if she asks a yes or no question during today's presentation. We also have some fun emojis that you can use throughout. So there's a smiley face at the end of this toolbar, and to the right of the smiley face is a little drop-down arrow. And from that drop-down arrow, you can find a way to give applause if you really like something Jackie says. Um, so you can, as I'm saying these, you can click on them just to see what they look like. You can uh, give a surprise face. This one's my favorite. That I can't believe she just said that face. Um, we also have the coffee mug, and this is the one that we do ask you to use if you have to step away during the presentation just for a few minutes. That way, like if we're asking questions or um, we see, you know, we ask you something and you're not there, we know that you've stepped away. Excellent. Now below the emoticons, you have a chat feature, and you can see that I was chatting there to everyone at the beginning, asking you to share, um, and you've got Jackie there saying that we're going to be talking about records, management, paper, and electronic. Um, let's see, Tammy said, well, for me, I have to say, my, yeah, we're all saying our office is where we struggle. Um, and there we go, and we've got some things, excited to be there. So in order to ch send a chat in today's presentation, all you have to do is type in the chat box that's below the send to all participants. So it's way over here in the lower part of your screen. Again, I just popped out a picture of it to point easier. So you would just type in the chat box and then you'd hit 
send. And then your instant message would show up in the chat box as well so that we can see. We encourage you to chat throughout today's presentation. If you have comments, fun comments you want to make, if you just want to ask a quick question uh, without raising your hand, you can put that in the chat box and we will answer as we um, get to a pausing point. Finally, the only other thing we're going to be using today is up in the upper left hand corner of your screen, you're going to see a toolbar that looks like this. So I'm pointing an arrow. So this toolbar is called the whiteboard toolbar. And you're going to find that way, I pointed an arrow here, it's going to find it way up here in the upper left hand corner of your screen. And each of these tools is a toggle as well. The only one we're going to be using today is the pointer tool. So if everyone could just use their mouse and click on the pointer button that's up in your computer screen one time so that it, you see it turn gray, or if you're on a Mac, it might turn a different color, and then come click anywhere on the screen, and you're going to see your pointer tool show up with your name. And give me a green check in the participant panel if you found it and that you can see it on the screen. That might be faster than me trying to figure it out. Perfect, I see Monica, yep, Ma, and I see, perfect, excellent, all right. And so today Jackie's just gonna be asking you at some point to maybe use that pointer tool to point at something on the screen, and that's gonna give her feedback throughout today's presentation. All right, so that's enough for me. Thank you everybody again for joining, and apologies, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Joanna Church, I'm the virtual program developer for Military Family Services US. Um, and again, I'm so pleased to bring you Jackie Hollywood Brown today. So Jackie, I'm gonna pass you the ball and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Joanna. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna very, try very hard to keep this presentation to one hour, although I'm, I'm quite passionate about organizing. Um, so it may run uh, over an hour. If you have to leave at the end of the hour, um, you know, that's fine. Um, the, the recording will still be available. At the end of this um, session, um, we will, uh, the, the presentation takes you to um, a page on my website where there's a lot of reference material that you can click on to get to um, various things that I'm um, talking about during the presentation. So don't feel like you have to, you know, ask me to pause or scribble it down. Everything that I reference um, will be on that web page. And if it's not, um, you know, you can feel free to send Joanna or, or myself an email and there's um and and we can, you know, um, make sure that web page is updated and get the information that you want on there. Okay? Is everybody ready to go? Some check marks, please. Check, 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 check. Okay, super. Well, let's go. Um, so the reason I put together this presentation um, is that, you know, I watch some home improvement TV shows and I've read a lot of organizing books and, and I'm looking at some of this information, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, gosh, you know, that doesn't apply to me because I'm a military family. And, you know, that information is not going to work for me because I'm, you know, we're a military family. So I put together this presentation to pull out the best of information that I've read all over um, the place that, that would help apply from, uh, apply specifically to military families. And I found this lovely little quote. Um, so, you know, we're not um, military people ourselves. We're spouses. Maybe some of you have um, worn the uniform. I have not. Um, but we support those who serve. So being well organized at home is a huge burden of stress from the military member. Um, being productive during work times um, helps us make the most of that free time we have together and that's, that's very important as well. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Kingston, Ontario. I have a master's degree in food chemistry from the University of Guelph and a records and information management certificate from St. Lawrence College. I have been a military spouse for over 25 years. My husband was with the uh, Royal Van Deuxième Régiment in Quebec City. Um, our postings have included Victoria, Quebec City twice, or Mokto, Gagetown, Toronto, Montreal, Trenton, Innsworth, United Kingdom, San Antonio, Texas, and the Packers are coming in next week because next week we're moving to Winnipeg. 
Um, I have been organized all of my life. Um, I've worked in a library, a pharmacy, um, I've worked retail, I've worked in research centers, and I've worked mostly in the manufacturing industry. I owned a professional organizing business for over nine years, and currently I am the editor-in-chief for unclutter.com, which is the leading online resource for home and office organization. And I also happen to be a virtual assistant for Audrey, Audrey Prenzel's Career Transition Services, and she is the leading military to civilian career transition specialist in Canada. So, I would like to know from you, you can either take your pointer and point at the division of um, the military that you're most familiar with or that you've served in, or, um, you know, um, and maybe let me know in the chat window uh, how long you've been with the military. Let's get some Navy people, some Army people, some Air Force people, eight years military spouse. Cool. Oh, another eight years. Great, great. Oh, 27 years. Okay, so she's a lifer like me. Alrighty. So, um, so just is uh, if you guys can tell me, maybe click a, take your pointer and click where exactly you are, sort of, or close to where you are, where the region is. Oh, we've got Karina. Hey, Karina. Yeah. Hi, Karina. Uh, hello, it's Elizabeth in uh, oh. <laughs> Joint Base Lewis McCord. How are you? And Karina's going to join us as well. Oh, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. We're just using our pointer tools to show where you are currently located around the world. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Haley, that's amazing. Marlene, wonderful. So exciting. Wow, there's everybody from everywhere. That's great. Is that is that green arrow on Hawaii? That must be a lovely posting. So if you could type exactly where you're located, that would be helpful too. You must type in where we're located. Oahu, Denver, Victoria. Bristol. So exciting to have our our uh Europe people here today. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, super awesome. All right, so let's get into the meat of today's topic. I've broken the session out into three sort of sections. Um, organizing your home, organizing your information, and organizing your time. And at the end of each section, I'm going to have some question and answers, and then at the very end, I'll have some more question and answer period time. But if you really have a question um, that, that's pressing, uh, feel free to raise your hand, and um, I'll, I'll try and get to the question. Joanne is going to take um, um, keep her eye on there and alert me if I get going uh, too fast. Okay, is everybody ready to go? Check marks, hands up. Ole oh, mai. Okay, we're almost ready. Everybody's ready to go. Super. Alrighty, so organizing your home. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to get involved a little bit more and take your pointers and let me know on the left whether you own your own home or rent your own home. So there's some homeowners, some renters, and you know if you're in the military housing that's a rental. And Amanda is in between the two. <laughs> I'll have to ask Amanda. Oh, she owns and rents. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so on the right-hand side of the slide, um, could you let me know if you live in a, in a high-rise type building or, or a, like a multi-family complex or a house type building? Everybody pretty much lives in a house type building. Great. Okay. Super. Thank you for that. That helps for the next slide. 
or for this next section about homes. So um, we're going to talk about organizing your space. And space is actually an acronym that was coined by Julie Morgenstern. She's a professional organizer um, in New York City. And this was done way back in 1998. And her book, Organizing from the Inside Out, was one of the first books that I read. Um, and the SPACE acronym is extremely useful because that's the order in which we get organized. And the order we get organized in determines our ability to stay organized. Um, you know, we're going to examine each of these steps in more details, but um, most people, I'm going to get my little pointer out here. Can I, can, yeah, there we go. Most people start at the containerizing step. You know, and that's really, um, you know, when you see that uh, um, flyer from Canadian Tire come out and, uh, you know, they have all of those lovely little baskets and bins and all of that stuff, um, you, you know, you really kind of want to buy lots of them. And for those of us here in the United States, um, we have the evil container store with all of its sexy bins. It's like, it's like pornography for your house. Um, and, and if we buy bins first, we end up storing stuff we don't need. So um, we'll move on to, to our first step, which is sorting. But first, we're going to welcome Leila. Leila? It's just Linda. Her audio isn't connected yet, so I'm just okay. I'm chatting her, trying to see if we can okay. get her set up. OK, super. Um, yes, and I, I'm a bit of a container addict, too. So, so sorting. Um, oops, just a second. Uh, we need to bring all of our things together to group them according to some common characteristics um, and, and then arrange them in sequence. So we have to do that so we know exactly what we have and how many of each thing we have. But it's important that we sort them in a way that makes sense to the end user that will help them decide exactly what they need to keep and what they can let go of. So here we have two different colors and two different shapes. So let's say they represent shirts, which are maybe the circles, and trousers, which are the triangles. So there's two ways we can sort these. We can sort them here on the left, we've sorted them by, by color, then by shape. And on the right, we've sorted by shape and then by color. So if you're looking at, let me see, get my pointer out here. If you're sorting by color and then by shape, you might say, OK, I'm going to put here, I'm going to put all of my work clothes together, all of my work shirts, and all of my work trousers together. And here are my weekend shirts and my weekend trousers. That's one way to organize your clothes. And if you're a military member, um, this makes sense because you have your uniforms and you have your civilian clothes. And that might make sense, you know, in certain cases. But if you're, you know, a civilian and you might decide, well, I'm going to put all my shirts together because some of these shirts I wear on the weekends and some of these shirts I wear during the week and sometimes I switch back and forth if it's a casual day at work and the same with my trousers. So I'm going to keep in my closet all of my shirts in one place and all of my trousers in another place. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, it, those are, are two ways to do it. Um, and both of them are correct. It just depends on, you know, um, what, what, you, what your end use is. Um, and so sometimes poor organization comes from poor communication. People aren't clear on what their important criteria are for sorting. Um, and this is especially important for um, helping other people organize their stuff. For example, like maybe your children. Um, you know, you might say, oh, okay, these are, you know, you go into your kid's room and you say, okay, these are all action figures. But, you know, if they sh might be, have to be sorted into Marvel um, action figures and DC action figures and, and then subdivided by superheroes and supervillains, or it just might be sorted by superheroes and supervillains and, and, and not by, by, you know, origin. So, um, Amanda's got a, an exclamation point up, and I'm not sure what that means. So oh, don't, don't worry about that. That's okay. fine. It's nothing. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. That's fine. So, um, you know, you really have to, to take a good look at, at how you're sorting. And if you're helping someone else, um, really have a good conversation about how, you know, what the criteria are for, for sorting um, your items. Now, when you're sorting, um, which is basically cleaning everything out and bringing it all together, um, you'll find stuff that you don't know what it is. And I call these unidentified found objects or UFOs. And so for every room that I'm helping organize, um, I'll have a little, like maybe shoebox or a little basket with some of these UFOs in it. And one of the best things to do is have your family members, including your children, help you sort through um, all of those um, bits and pieces. Um, for example, oh, a few years ago, I guess it was maybe uh, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, I ended up having to do a complete kitchen reorganization because of some flooding. Um, and uh, I found a small bit of plastic in one of the drawers. And it looked vaguely familiar, kind of, but I'm like, I wasn't sure really what it was. But I kept it in the shoebox. Um, and until I was finished organizing, and then I got it out and I, I showed the rest of the family. And my son was absolutely ecstatic because I had found a, a piece of his magic set that had been missing for a couple of months, I guess. So, um, and yes, uh, you can involve toddlers in, in the sorting um, because um, they're the ones that are, are playing. I mean, you have to sort of adjust it to their level though. I mean, they cannot make many or very complicated decisions. Yes, toddlers. Toddlers can make some pretty basic decisions. And, um, you know, they know what they like and they know what they don't like. I mean, that doesn't mean you have to pay attention or, or follow their, quote, orders. Um, but you can certainly get them thinking about making choices. And... Um, asking them about putting like with like. Um, that's something that they have to do all of their lives is look at items and sort, um, sort them by some criteria. And um, for them to sort, you know, a whole bunch of, yeah, and, and, and absolutely, you absolutely need to game it. You absolutely need to game it. Um, and, and even like, you know, there's, there's some tricks that, that we can use to help, help people along. Gaming it is one. Uh, timing it is another. How fast, how hard can you go? What, you know, how much can you get done in, um, in, in five minutes, in ten minutes? Um, so, you know, really think about, uh, about that. And, and, yes, do get the family involved because it is the family's space. So... <clears throat> So do people have children? I, I take it from the toddler question. There are people with toddlers. Um, so if you want to either write in the chat box or just check if you have kids or take your pointer and tell me, you know, point one and three-year-olds. Well, one-year-old might be kind of young for this, but certainly a three-year-old can make some basic decisions. High school. Great. Great. So we're looking at mostly the children are preschoolers, toddlers, and high school, and out. Oh my, Tammy, you've got a lot of kids. <laughs> That's a pretty big age range. Okay, so so thank you for that. Um, that helps me, uh, you know, uh, direct the talk. So super, we'll just move on to the next important step, which I think everybody needs, which is purging. So now that we've got our items sorted, we can see how many of each thing that we have and how it's classified. Um, we can decide what we're going to keep and what we're going to let go. So um, when when the, we'll, we'll go through these, there's a, a lot of points here, so we'll go through this in a couple of different slides, um, a couple of steps at a time. So with military families, I ask to, I like to ask them. Have you used it on this posting? This woman has a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, eleven and twelve, fourteen and twenty-three-year-old. And 
if, if they haven't used it in this posting, the answer may be it's time to let it go. Um, however, there are exceptions. For example, here in Texas, we don't need snowsuits. We don't even really wear sweaters. Like seriously, in December, it's barely, um, it's barely cold enough to wear a sweater. However, we have snowsuits. We know we're going back to Canada, actually next week. Um, our snowsuits are in really good shape. They still fit us, and they're properly stored. So we're going to keep those. Um, I see. Uh, Yes, there is the one-year rule. If you haven't used it in one year or six months, um, it is definitely time to, to rethink why you have it. Um, that's, that's not to say, you know, for example, if you have a maternity dress and you haven't used it in six months, but, you know, next year you might be planning another child, then, you know, that might be something you want to keep. So, anyways, we'll, we'll <clears throat> move right along. The next question is, is it broken beyond, beyond repair? And if it is, you know, let's let it go. If it is fixable, make an appointment on your calendar to research how and where to get it repaired, and then set a date to get the repair done. And give yourself a deadline of like, you know, two weeks from now. And if you haven't even looked into how to get it fixed between now and two weeks from now, then Maybe it's not that important and you can let it go. And one of the things I recommend people reduce their use of is unitaskers. Now you see on the left here, uh, this is a bacon cooker. Uh, it only cooks bacon. Uh, it's bigger than a toaster and it weighs over two kilograms. And on the right, we have a frying pan. Doesn't weigh two kilograms, and it cooks a lot more than just many, many more things than just bacon. So we we ask. I, I tend to ask families like, why are you keeping this? If it's a unitasker, if it only does one thing, um, you know, maybe it's time to let it go. Especially if you rarely or never ever use it. Oh, Margaret regifts them. Um, yeah, that's that's an option. I mean, if you got an espresso machine and you really don't drink espresso, let it go. Um, you know, uh, if you're not using it, like the snow cone maker that we've had in our f cupboard for, I don't know, three postings now, um, a popcorn maker, a fondue warmer, and several other unit taskers. Yes, um, that's fine. If you are, uh, If you do like popcorn and you eat popcorn two or three times a week, then by all means keep your popcorn maker. If you um, if you have espresso every day or even every week, that's your little Saturday morning relax thing. Then by all means keep your espresso maker. But really take a serious look at your unitaskers and see if you're using them. Um, now there's a thing that I'd like to mention between unitaskers and multitaskers. I have a big, huge multitasker. It's a food processor. And while my cheese grater, well, my grater is just a grater and I have to, you know, rake the cheese back and forth across that thing with the hand, the food processor does it much faster. But by the time I get the food processor put together and the grater blade in it and the, and the cheese run through the machine and then all six or seven of those bits and pieces washed, it's really just easier to use my hand food grater and just wash and put that in the dishwasher. So, you know, sometimes a multitasker isn't exactly what you're looking for. So think about how you're using the tools that you have and consider letting go of the ones that you're really not using or really promise to make your life easier but actually make your work more difficult. So um, the next question is, how many do you need? Um, and I like to think of it as, you know, for example, you may have a ton of dress socks, but only black ones. Well, how many do you need? Well, I work from home, and um, so three pairs of black dress socks are plenty for me. If you work in an office, you might need seven pairs. 
if you're a fitness buff and you're a runner, um, you know, or you're going to the gym every day, you might need 10 pairs of sports socks. But if when you go to the gym you do yoga and bare feet, you might not need any socks. So, um, you know, ask yourself, you know, how many do I need? Um, I would love to get rid of my food processors, which I rarely use. <laughs> Um, I don't know what a Ninja Blender is, but I have a hand blender and I love it. Um, it does not do uh, ice cubes, so I'm out of luck for margaritas here in Texas, but it does puree food. Okay, so um, okay, so back to yeah. Think about when you when you're looking at the the number of things do you have? How often do you do laundry? How often do you wash dishes? You know, you may be able to do more laundry, laundry more frequently and have fewer items of clothing, or you may choose, um, for example, my son uh, lives in an apartment building, he's uh, at university, and in his building it costs him $5.50 to do a wash and a dry. So he's opted, and, and he has to go to the basement of the building and, you know, it takes him all day, whatever. I don't really think it takes him all day, but he says it does. Um, so for him, it's easier to have a few more items of socks and underwear and undershirts and do laundry less frequently. But it's up to you. So take a look at your lifestyle and see, um, you know, how often, uh, you, you know, you need to do uh, laundry and dishes. Okay, so the next question, and I'm speaking here um, mostly about clothes. but does it fit? Um, does it fit you now? Is it comfortable? Um, does it fit your lifestyle? Uh, you see my lovely picture of Miss uh, 19 early 80s uh, there with her big huge shoulder pads. Um, you know most people do when I start talking about does it fit, does it fit you, does it fit your lifestyle? Um, it, it, you, I, they think I'm talking about women, but I've seen men retire from, you know, a 30-year career and try and fit into the t-shirts that they had from high school. Um, you know, it doesn't fit. Um, my husband has over 100 shirts. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, you can do things with your clothes, such as make quilts, take pictures, um, you know, let it go. It's just... It's just clothing. Um, uh, I see there's another comment about uh, men loving their shirts. Yes, um, I had a friend who had a quilt made from the logos from old shirts. So that certainly is an option. Um, so, you know, get rid of clothes that you're, that you're not wearing that don't suit your lifestyle. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier about maternity wear but also about um, suits and, and ball gowns. Um, if you have classically styled formal wear, um, you know, and you haven't worn it in a year, um, it doesn't mean you need to, you know, donate it to charity or, or you know, sell it at, through eBay or something. Um, you might just want to move it out of your regular closet into a guest room closet. Um, so uh, that, that's an option too. Uh, and um, I'm surprised nobody's asked me uh, this with all of these females on um, the call, but usually somebody asks me about wedding dresses, the wedding gown. Um, and really, it's only been in the last half of the previous century that women have been keeping wedding gowns. Um, prior to that, it was really too expensive to buy a dress. Um, and wear it only once. Um, often wedding gowns were passed on to other family members or um, the fabric was used to create kiss christening gowns for children. Um, and so, uh, you know, you probably got more photos of yourself in your wedding dress than any other piece of clothing you have. So, you know, considering, you know, let the dress go. Um, especially if it was maybe from a previous failed marriage, you, you, because you don't need that kind of karma in your house. 
So um, let's move on to Does It Spark Joy? Now, Marie Kondo's book, um, and probably you've heard of it, it was big in the news, um, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Um, she asks readers if the item sparks joy. So when you look at some of items, yeah, um, you know, does it remind you of happy times? Um, or is it, do you look at it and say, why do I have to dust this? If you tend to get the latter feelings, it's probably time to let the object go. Um, even if the item does bring you joy or significant happy memories, ask whether a photo of the item or a photo of, re of a related event would do the same thing. For example, if you have like a plastic chechki from you know, a carnival that your family went to and had a great time, but you know, maybe the piece of plastic is kind of ugly, ask whether you know, putting a, a photo of your family at that carnival would be a better reminder of fun than the piece of crappy plastic. Um, yes, and that's the thing. Sparking, when, when you ask whether it sparks joy, um, you know, we've been talking about purging and letting go and purging and letting go. Um, Marie Kondo's book and, and the spark joy question flips it around. It asks you, what do you really want to keep in your life? And you keep that and then the rest can go. So, <clears throat> so another question that works with some people, um, I asked, um, would you buy it again? right now at full price? And if the answer is no, then you can probably let the item go. <laughs> um, if, oh, and, and another question that I specifically ask to military families is when you're moving, imagine that the truck that all your stuff is on explodes. Would you rebuy that item to put in your home? And that's another way of looking at it. So that that's purging. So we'll move along to the next question. And this is kind of hard for military families, mostly because we move so often. Um, <clears throat> The, the, <clears throat> hang on a second, please. Okay, the next question is, where does it go? Um, do, you, do you, can you sell it online? Should you sell it online? Um, my personal limit is $25. If I don't think I can get $25 for it, I really don't think it's worth my time to um, you know, take photos of it, list it on an online classified ad, and you know, wait for people to get back to me. I, I just find that um, um, rather daunting for you know, only getting twenty-five dollars, and then you probably have to negotiate down to fifteen. But you know, it's it's not worth my time. Most of the time, items are just donated. Um, some are donated to other family members. Um, uh, there are charity shops, uh, as my friend calls it, the, the VV Boutique. Um, hang on here, VV Boutique, or as we like to call it, uh, as it's normally known, it's Value Village. Um, there's Goodwill, um, our options for donations. Um, animal shelters will take blankets, towels, and some types of pillows. Um, if you are going to donate to a charity, though, um, please ensure that they want or need your items. Check their websites or phone to ask. Um, some charities only take certain goods. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and, you know, be nice. Ensure the items are clean before you donate. Um, think about it this way. If you would not give the item to a friend, you might not want to donate it to charity. Um, it costs the charity's money to get rid of your garbage. 
So, um, you know, uh, consider that before you donate. Um, some retail locations uh, have take-back programs. Um, so, um, you know, that's, uh, that's certainly an option. And there's community events, um, swap parties, um, you know, and then the local garbage stream and hazardous waste stream. So <clears throat> assigning a home for an item. This is the third step. Um, and we try to think of um, where the item will be used. So we think about safety. Um, and if you go to my slide, you can see the chemical cupboard, um, which we called the scary cupboard that I helped uh, with a client clean out. Um, you know, uh, so think about where you're going to store stuff. Think about a vacation home for the item. Um, and who is responsible for the item? Cleaning, moving, um, those sorts of things. Um, so you'll see my little picture there. Uh, I tend to store items that are used often within arm's reach. Items that are used occasionally, lower down. Items that are used rarely, higher. But if you're really tall or you have back problems and have, um, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, you can adjust it if you have children, if you're really tall. For example, my son's over six feet in his kitchen. Everything is up high. Um, so, you know, those certainly options. So we're talking about next containers, finally. Um, you would like, ideally, you'd like to have um, a container that uh, fits not only the stuff you want to put in it, but the place where you want to put it. So um, measure twice, buy once. Um, and again, you know, we're military families, so think about that container may not fit on that shelf in your next house. So think about uh, other places you can use various different types of containers. Um, and See if you can live pre-packed, because that's that's a huge load off your mind when you move. Is you know the movers come in, you know they put all of you for your all of your bins in one box, close up the box, and you just take them out at the other end, and everything's automatically organized. So um, that's that's certainly something you can think of. And I'm going to go through a few slides quickly. Some of my favorite containers. I like to look at flexible containers. And what I mean by flexible is that they can be easily reconfigured um, to uh, fit somewhere else. So you'll see the container on the left, it's not flexible. It only fits a certain size of drawer. And um, that, I had, uh, yeah, PMQ drawers are notoriously small and they're never ever the same size. Um, so I ended up with, I think, four or five of these cutlery trays that um, were of all sorts of various sizes. And finally, I ended up going with the flexible system, which is the system on the right, that can be reconfigured into a whole bunch of different ways um, and fit any different types of drawer. One of my other favorite things to use for organizing is the car cup gum container. You have to chew a lot of gum to get enough of these containers, but I have teenagers, so that's not really a problem for me. Um, but they do everything. They hold paper clips. They hold Q-tips. Um, they're nice because you can see right through the top and see what's in it. Um, they have a, a lid where you can um, dispense one item at a time, or um, you can flip it the other way and take a spoon and spoon items out or pour a whole bunch out at once. Um, the other item that I love is the Stanley Professional Organizer. This is great because you can put the lid down on this thing, turn it upside down, shake it, and the stuff still stays all in its little teeny containers in that thing. So if you've got a bunch of screws and nuts and bolts and hooks and all that kind of stuff, if you put it in there, it will stay in there until you open the lid. Um, it's very, very helpful for keeping all of those little gadgets organized. Um, vacuum bags with the tote are another one of my favorite items. Um, 
vacuum bags themselves are slippery, they don't stack, and they're a hassle, you slide them in a tote, zip the tote lid closed, and you can pile up um, those vacuum bags. They're great for extra sheets and towels. And all um, I don't use them so much for clothing, but for sheets and towels and, and winter, um, winter blankets and stuff, they're excellent. Um, if you have a few of those, you can pack your stuff, your, your linens in it before you move, and it will be nice and clean when you get to the other end. So um, another item on the, on the right here is a six liter shoe box. Um, ideal not just for shoes, but things like um, first aid supplies, extra toothbrushes and toothpaste and floss, um, storing razor blades in those, um, you know, shaving kit stuff, extras in there, um, put a label on it. Again, the, the moving company comes, they just take those bins out, stack them in a box, closed, you're packed. The other end, you just open the box and put them on your shelf. Uh, again, this is probably one of my favorite bins. Um, why? Because they fit on the nice heavy-duty resin shelving, which come apart, go together, perfect for storing things in the garage, um, gardening tools, um, you know, um, all sorts of you know bicycle equipment, um, helmets, life jackets, um, and they're great. Again, really, really easy to organize your home when you move. You store all your stuff in there. Shelving comes down, shelving goes up, boom. You're organized in your new house. The last step is one that a lot of people forget about. Um, but you need to maintain your system. And again, you know, it's a hassle folding clothes, but when I remember what I look like naked, I keep folding. So, Maintaining your system is important. Maintaining your system, um, you know, weekly, go around, put everything back where it belongs. You can do that at the end of every day as well. Um, and remember, nothing is permanent. So you may have assigned a home to, to something and put it, put it in a container. And um, it, it's not working. Every time, you know, you go to that thing, it's somewhere else. Reconsider where you've assigned that home. If it's not working for you, change it. <clears throat> and, you know, keep motivated. Um, so, I don't know, look at yourself naked in the mirror and keep folding. So, equalizing is important. I mean, that will keep you going. So, here are some common organizing mistakes. Now, I, I have to um, take a minute and explain this little photo. My, um, my boss at Unclutterer sent this to me with the quote, if you, can, if you cut your tennis balls in half, you can store two more tennis balls in the same space, which is totally useless because now the tennis balls are unusable. But, you know, um, that's the last point on this slide, blindly following organizing advice. Um, but we'll go from the top down. Buying without thought, uh, we need to think about you know, when you're considering buying something, uh, how, how is it going to be used? Where is it going to be stored? Who is going to maintain it? Um, will I need to have an off-season storage for this item? And uh, I believe it was um, Joanna that mentioned before, um, she buys a lot of containers uh, with no real plan. so. Uh, and that's, I tend to be guilty of that as well. Um, another thing is organizing a place instead of a system. Um, somebody said, well, I'm, you know, I keep organizing my bedroom because there are clothes all over. I keep organizing my bedroom because there are clothes all over. Maybe what you need to do is organize the process in which you do laundry. Um, so that's something you can think of, organizing a system instead of organizing a place. Um, another big problem, and this I've heard a lot with military families, is organizing somebody else without their permission. Um, you know, we, we need to be mindful that even though our spouses are deployed um, and we have to live with their stuff, it's still 
their stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, do respect the ownership of, of somebody's thing. Choosing an appearance over function, um, you know, that uh, that's, um, can work, it, it often doesn't. And again, blindly following organizing advice, uh, such as, you know, oh, if I haven't used it in a year, I'll throw it out. If, um, you know, th those kinds of things may work for some people and they may, may not work. Um, so that's, that's that. And I see we're at an hour already and I'm only one third done. Um, but uh, we'll... Uh, You're fine, just keep going and if people need to um, pop off, they can always listen to the recording. Okay, so are there any specific questions to organizing your home? Yes, okay. Um, any questions? Hands up, no? Maybe? Yes, Amanda. You can either type or unmute yourself. It's up to you. All right, I just I forgot I could unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> um, so my my question is, uh, I, one of my struggles is that I'm always trying to save money. So things like I'm doing cloth diapering and I'm like, um, you know, wanting to coupon and stockpile a little bit, but obviously that that all like that's just creating more clutter in my house. So do you have any words of advice for how to balance that, like? maybe making a choice between, you know, not stockpiling quite so much <laughs> and maybe spending a bit more to buy it later, but at least you're not dealing with the yeah. mountains of stuff. <laughs> yes, and, and that's, yeah, um, and, and that's a problem, especially uh, mountains of stuff is what, um, you know, capitalism depends on to function and mm -hmm. retailers want us to do. They keep wanting us to buy more, buy more, buy more. And um, actually, I just read a statistic from Statistics Canada that single-person households have, for the first time, outnumbered family households in Canada. So, um, you know, we're going to start seeing the trend that they're going to have to start coming down on pricing for single-pack items. But I, I'm getting away from the point. Okay, so you need to take a look at how long it takes you to use something. One of the things that I started doing was, for example, when I open a bottle of ketchup, write the date with a Sharpie on the ketchup when I open that bottle. Okay, and so like we, and, and I've, I've had a really good gauge here because we've been in San Antonio for a year. And when we moved in in, in July 2016, I bought a pack of, of ketchup mustard relish. And I wrote the date, yeah, we moved, I bought them when we moved in. We're moving out, we've still got a half a bottle of relish and, a, and like three quarters of a bottle of mustard. Like, so I, I don't really need, like, in, and it's almost at its due date. So I'm like, when you start buying things, it's like, oh, yes, but, you know, toilet paper doesn't have a due date. It's like, but how much can you reasonably use? Like, how much toilet paper are you using? Are you using two, three rolls a week? Um, you know, how much are you using? And then say, how much space do I have to store that? Um, and say to yourself, well, you know, I don't, I, you know, we're using four rolls of toilet paper a week. I have space to store, you know, 36 rolls. Um, so, you know, that's nine weeks worth of toilet paper. So I only have to buy toilet paper every, say, eight weeks. You know, so, you know, those are things that you've got to do some calculations in your head. And Amanda collects condiments like crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, take a look at how fast you're using it. Because really, um, and I will put this link up on my website. Um, uh, it's a link called stilltasty.com. And one of the things that, that uh, they'll indicate to you is once you open a jar of, of mayonnaise, it's only good for about, oh, three to four weeks once it's opened. Uh-oh. So, you know, if you're, buying, if you're buying, if you're, you know, if you're your family of two, if it's, if you're buying, you know, like three liter bottle, um, 
well, you know, of, of mayonnaise and you're not using it within three weeks, you probably should pitch it out. So you're actually losing money. Oh, okay. Um, there's another question. <laughs> it's Joanna. Um, so in response to what she specifically was asking about with the couponing, um, because you want those great deals and you can get X number of things, I know what some of some of my friends who were into extreme couponing like that, um, what they would do is, so because obviously they didn't have houses big enough for all of the, you know, the 20 things of ketchup or whatever, they would uh, go with friends and then they would split it. Absolutely. And so yeah, that was absolutely. a way to still get the great discount, still not pay for as much for your groceries, um, but then split it with a friend so that that way you're not holding on to 100 jars of mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's certainly true. And I have done that with Costco membership. Um, you know, um, um, you know, shared and, and you go in, you buy the big club pack and you share it between two or three families. If you've got some neighbors that are willing to do that, that's amazing and, and you know, take advantage of that. Um, some, some spices, I see somebody's put up here, spices are only good for three months. Some of them are, are not even good for three months and some of them are good for much longer than three months. It really depends on what the spice is and you've got to, you know, take a look at Still Tasty. And it also depends on where you're storing them. So, um, you know, that, that makes a huge difference. So, yes, Haley, I will be addressing papers in the next section. And I saw your question about, you know, children's paperwork as it comes home from school. Um, so, uh, yes, um, for those of you joining us from Europe, um, yes, they have uh, smaller sizes of everything, and it's lovely. Um, and the refrigerators are small. Uh, here in the United States, um, you can't buy small packages of anything. And, and it is frustrating um, to, to see, you know, uh, food uh, go bad. Yeah, I know everything's bigger in Texas. Um, it, it is very frustrating and sad to see food uh, go to waste um, just because you can't use it in time. And that's the smallest um, size you can buy. Um, yeah, Haley, do you order, uh, Haley's the one from Bristol? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, do you do home delivery of groceries? Because that's helpful. Um, that's, that was love, that got me through life in England. So, yes, get on that. It's lovely. Okay, so we're, we're done with, with the home and we're gonna start looking at your information. All right, your information is more difficult to organize than your stuff because you actually have to read and think about information. So before um, we used to have like, um, those of us who were adulting before 1990 and the internet, remember that we just had filing cabinets full of paper and now we get um, stuff in filing cabinets, uh, like our electronic filing cabinets. We get email and we get paper because they lied to us and told us it was gonna be a paper-free society and it's not. So we're gonna talk about records and information management. Um, and a record is information that is received by us in order to conduct our daily business in any format. So, um, and yes, uh, this is very important for military families um, because we get, I think, more paperwork than anything else. And the hard part about being military family is that um, some parts of the military and with some agencies, outside agencies we deal with, will only accept paper records, even if the file was originally a, um, an electronic file. Um, some will only want it electronic. It's, it's really difficult to know what's what. So there are several different types of records. There are active records. Those are the ones that you need to, to do something with right now, like the, the electric bill you have to pay this month, um, the water bill you have to pay this month, that kid's form that you have to sign and send back to school. Those are your active records, okay? Inactive records are 
the ones that you've already dealt with, but you still have to keep for some reason. Um, so, for example, your last year's income tax, um, you know, your, your instruction manuals for items you've purchased and still own, those are inactive records. Another very important type of record are vital records, your birth certificate, um, your social security number or social insurance number, um, the deed for your house, um, all of those things, le legal documents, passports, wills, marriage license, um, anything that might be really difficult to replace, those are vital records. And finally, we have archives. And a lot of people might be asking the question, um, do you, aren't archives the same thing as inactive records? And the answer is actually no. Archives, uh, well, an inactive record, once you no longer need to keep an inactive record, it's destroyed. Archives are a curated collection, a curated collection of inactive records that are kept. So, for example, um, <clears throat> Your uh, collection, uh, for example, you know, you, the first pay stub that you ever received, you might want to keep that, um, but you don't need to keep every pay stub that you receive. So, <clears throat> so here's just a quick view of, an, of a record's life. It gets, um, let me get my pointer back here. Um, oops, there we go. A record is created. It's active until you deal with it, then it becomes inactive, and then you can dispose of it either by saving it in your archives or deleting or destroying it somehow. So um, there's these general, generally accepted record-keeping principles. And basically, you know, I'll, I'll just run through them quickly, is who, who is responsible for the record-keeping in your house? Who, who manages the paperwork and the computer files? Um, uh, are the records that you have, are they authentic and reliable? Um, if you were audited, um, would you be able to produce the records? Uh, are your records safe? Are they in a locked filing cabinet? If they're on your computer, are they backed up and password protected? Um, are you sure you're adhering to all the laws and regulations regarding keeping records? Can you find the records you need when you need them? Are you keeping them for the, as long as you need to keep? Um, are you destroying them securely at the end of their life when you no longer need them? And can anyone sort of walk in and understand your system? Why anyone? I mean, if you're managing the system, uh, if something happened to you, could your spouse come in and take over and be able to do it? Or if something happened to you, would your executor or um, be able to manage, you know, be able to find all of your records. So, um, can can you guys either can can everybody can you give me a check mark if you're really comfortable with Microsoft Excel or an X if you're not? Good. Okay. On my on the website at the end, I'm going to be giving you a spreadsheet because what we're going to be talking about next is a records inventory. And this is uh, to help you manage your records. Go through really quickly, not quickly, but you know fairly quickly and and see which records you have. Um, and where you know, look at the date span that you have where's my point here? Look at the date that you have them. Um, you can give them a brief description, what format they're in, whether they're paper or electronic, how often you get them, um, what category they fall under. And if you don't know a category, once you go through the records that you have, things will sort of group into categories. Um, how often they're accessed when you do have them and where they're located. So I've made a spreadsheet for you that has all of these headings on them, on it, and you can download that from the website at the end of the session. So once you've <clears throat> once you've managed to do your inventory, 
then you can build the retention schedule. And most people, um, this is the hardest part for them, is asking themselves, how long do I keep this stuff? And some people either keep everything just in case, and they end up with housefuls of paper and hard drives full of files, and they may or may not be able to find it. And then some people destroy everything just to keep things simple and realize they've shredded or deleted um, an important information. So, you know, um, that's something that, that you need to do. And it's a tedious task to go through, um, but one that you can't ignore. Now, you'll notice there's another column on here called the citation. And um, like we, have, we have over here our retention, how long we need to keep them, and our citation is um, what rule sort of guides how long we keep them. Now, in business, this, this can be a reference to a law, but for us, it can just be where we found the information. So for those of you who are OutCan or have been OutCan, um, a good place to check of where you need to keep your, um, or how long you need to keep documents is your orderly room or support unit. For example, those of us who have lived out can and are receiving the rent and utility allowance, we need to keep our rent bills and utility bills for as long as we keep our income taxes. So for example, if we, we've got our, if we're receiving um, rent and utility allowance in 2017, um, we have to keep our utility bills for six years after 2017. So um, that's something that, that you need to, uh, you, sh you should check about um, what benefits you're receiving and whether or not you need to keep those, those documents that support those benefits. Um, other, other places, um, other places you can look for information about um, document retention, um, Revenue Canada. And again, I have a link um, to that on my website that talks about record keeping. You can make an appointment with your bookkeeper, your uh, tax accountant, um, lawyer, um, investment advisors, or your bank manager. You can ask those. Medical professionals, um, your doctor, dentist, um, will be able to give you information on how long you should keep those records. Um, your employer. Um, so. You know, do check, and remember, um, don't check with your friend uh, because, or you know, another military family, because you never know if your situation is different from theirs. So I, I encourage people to do all of their own research, um, and not just you know go on the Facebook group and say, oh, you know, should I throw out my utility bills? And somebody's like, well, I never keep mine for more than a year but they haven't been receiving the utility allowance. So, um, you know, do take into account your own situation. So again, there's this retention, this retention schedule is on um, my website for you to download. So that's there. So once you've determined, you've done your retention schedule and you say, okay, these are the whole things of, of pile of paper I can get rid of. I encourage everybody to quickly look at every single page. You don't, because you've already made the decision that you're getting rid of it, you don't actually have to read and think about it, but please go through every single paper. And the reason I'm saying that is just because it's very easy for something important like a birth certificate or a, an adoption certificate or a marriage license to get stuck between something like two electric bills. You can be going, you know, electric bill, electric bill, electric bill, oh, birth certificate, keep that, electric bill, electric bill, electric bill. This is sort of like, you know, making sure you check all the pockets of your clothes before you donate something to charity. So, you know, on your computer, you can use the preview mode in on your PC to look in files before you delete them or quick look on a Mac. Okay? Um, you know, for shredding paper, you can buy a cross-cut shredder. Um, they're not very expensive. 
Um, if you have boxes and boxes of paper, I suggest you outsource that, um, you know, because it will take you months to shred it and you'll probably burn out your brand new shredder. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, electronic, if you're get, getting rid or deleting an entire hard drive, you know, make sure you do the, you know, 14 swipe pass um, of Department of Defense level secure um, deletion, not just delete the files. Um, okay, now I'm going to stop here for a second because I want to tell you, um, I know there's a lot of information in this information section. On the website unclutterer.com, there is an entire seven-part series about records and information management that you can read through. It's a lot more detailed than I'm presenting here now, um, but it is, again, linked to from the website at the end of this presentation. If you go to unclutterer.com and search for RIM, R-I-M, it will bring up every one in the session, or every, every episode, every blog post in that series. So, yes, so uh, by all means go there um, and you can read all of this in detail. Um, and it's much more detailed than I can present right now. So um, the next thing is here's to ACE, or Assign a Home, Containerize, and Equalize your filing system. So assigning a home, I always assign a home close to where I will process those paper papers. Um, and that could be at my desk, it could be, um, you know, at the dining room table, but there's my inbox. Um, thank you for participating, Haley. Um, if you need any more questions, feel free to send me an email um, after this webinar closes. And uh, for those people who are in Europe, um, I'm in contact with the virtual program uh, developer there in Europe, and so we'll be sharing the link to the webinar with her, and she'll make sure it gets out into uh, her advertisements as well for the webinar, okay? Okay, so um, your inactive records, um, if you don't need to access them with any regularity, um, feel free to put them in a filing box in the basement or in the attic. Um, should be somewhere safe, protected from flooding, um, but uh, that's, you know, you don't need to keep them near where you are. Um, containerize, you know, you, there's several different um, types of file folders you can use. My favorite are the Pendaflex. Um, I like the because they, they hook on the rails. Um, you know, you can choose different colors. You can, um, you know, pick different types of tabs and labels and make it pretty or very plain um, and simple. It's, it's up to you. So equalize, again, um, I, I recommend for those of you with children, and I, I think it was Haley who mentioned, that, you know, all of the paper that comes home with kids, you know, have one place for where it arrives in the house, and at the end of every day, go through and action that. It might take you 10, 15 minutes, but go through and separate action, um, the action items that you have to, to, to work with, and then file everything that you don't. Um, for those of you with older kids or maybe no kids, um, maybe a weekly filing is all that you need. And then annually update your retention schedule and dispose of those items that you no longer need to keep. So here are some tips to ace your filing system. Um, what I like to do within each file folder, this is a little picture of my um, automobile and auto insurance folder. Um, you'll see we own a, 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 a Sonic, that's all the paperwork for the Sonic. This is a group of paperwork of the tracks. This is all about our car insurance, and this is about our driving licenses. And it's all in one folder, automobile insurance. And, and I, of course, you know, I have my little label maker, and I've made little labels for all of these, these clips because, you know, I like nice, neat printing. Um, but if you don't um, 
if, if you don't have a label maker and you have black clips, a silver Sharpie um, works wonders. Or, you know, you can take a little bit of white out, paint it white, and then write with black pen. It's up to you. Um, one of the things that will help you stay organized is naming your paper folders and your electronic folders the same names. And I'll show a slide of that in just a minute. Um, and using consistent file names for your electronic files. Um, the date format, year, 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 month, month, day, day, um, putting that in your file name is really helpful for keeping your files in order on your computer. So this is an example of my filing system on my computer. You'll notice I've called it an original name of filing cabinet. And here's a snapshot of some of my, my folders, um, automobiles, and, and uh, right down to utilities. And in my utilities folders, I've separated them all out, cable, cell phone, electric, and I've relabeled my electric bills um, for each month. Because when I download them, it just says bill.pdf. So I have to, you know, I have to relabel them because it's just crazy. Um, I mean, if you try and search for a specific bill and everyone is labeled bill, you can't do it. So you'll notice I also have files here for guarantees and instructions. Um, and that, again, as I mentioned before, um, were the any of the electronic um, versions of the owner's manuals that I happen to have. And health, medical, and dental um, is, is another one. And those are sort of outside my filing cabinet because they're the ones that I keep um, forever. I don't get rid of them on, a, on an annual basis as I do some of these files. So tips for reducing information overload. Unsubscribe from stuff you're not actually reading. Um, streamline your email by shunting it to a separate mailbox um, for those e people who receive email newsletters. Um, stop watching the news all the time. I know we need to watch the news, but you don't need to watch it constantly. Um, it, two or three times a day, morning, noon, evening is fine checking in. The same with social media. You don't need to check in all the time. Um, or, or, or have those alerts, turn off the alert, um, mute certain terms that you are just finding annoying. And I always suggest to people that they unfollow the chicken littles, you know, the ones that are saying, oh, nuclear war, oh, this is, oh, you know, um, that's really frustrating to listen to them. So are there any questions specifically about your information? No, maybe you have lost everybody. No, I love I, I I love like just keep the keeping track because this is where I tend to fall short. So yeah. I think this is good information. Like, and it helps to see sort of like how you had your files set up and how yeah. like and your I'm, electronic yeah. files and so that's really great. Yeah. Amanda, so Amanda, Amanda, you can either mute your unmute yourself or type. It's your choice. Yeah, I just wondered um, how did you how did you personally decide to store information so that it's easily accessible in case of an untimely death? <laughs> wow, that's a really good question. Um, uh, my, uh, my untimely death, do you mean? Yeah, like, like I guess I'm more thinking like, like my spouse knows where to find everything and how the system works, but what if, you know, and hopefully this never does happen, but what if we were to like go in a car put it together, like, that, that's a really, really good point. That is a really, really good point. Um, I have a little instruction book, um, and and I, I started this whole program with my husband's aunt. Um, we uh, She has no children, and my husband and I are the executors for her estate. And she's made a little folder in her filing cabinet that says, what to do when I'm dead or incapacitated? And she's she's rather blunt, and she has an excellent sense of humor. Well, I have one, and I've just labeled it in case of emergency. 
on cast d'urgence. So, so I guess that a follow-up question for me would be, like, I'm currently across the world from my executor, so it, it wouldn't necessarily be possible for them to get here right away. So yes. is there a way to do that electronically, or what would you suggest? Absolutely, absolutely. There are, are various ways to do this electronically. Um, you know, they will, if they're your executor, they will have to come physically um, to do it, but they can certainly, you can certainly um, have a Dropbox folder or, or shared folder in the cloud somewhere where you can dump information um, that uh, is secure. Um, you know, I'm not sure if Dropbox would be the most secure thing, but you can certainly send them an encrypted PDF, um, a password protected PDF of how, um, what they can, you know, they can open it up if there's an emergency and read, you know, the steps um, to take in, the, in case, you know, you were hospitalized or, or dead. Um, and, uh, you know, it would list, um, you know, emergency contact people, um, where to find your important files, um, and, um, and, and any other information that they would need to know, contact information of, of people, um, you know, that they would need uh, to, to manage the business of your existence or lack thereof. Does, does that help you? Yes, thank you. That lots of good ideas there. Thank you. Yeah, and I I can address that point uh, too um, a little bit uh, after after the fact. And also, if you look on unclutterer.com, um, there are some good suggestions there about what to do um, in case of emergencies. Okay. Are there any other questions about your information? No. Um, is your slideshow going to be posted on your website? Um, uh, the slides will not be, but the, the recording will be available um, through MFS services. Is that correct, Joanna? That's correct. We have it on our, we'll have it up on the website once it becomes available. We'll also make sure we put the link to it on our Facebook pages and on our newsletters. Okay, thank you. And once, once the news, once the link becomes available, I will also put that up on my web page as well. Fantastic, thank you. Okay. All right, any other questions? I think Amanda's hand was still just up from before. So okay. you can go ahead okay. and finish it up. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Nope, that's okay, Amanda, no worries. Okay. No worries, I just wanted to make sure we, we covered everything. And now we're pressed for time, but your time. Um, you know, this uh, lovely little chart of this pyramid I got from Productivity Advice for the Weird. And I don't know why he called it that, because it is not weird. To me, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the fundamentals of being productive are good sleep, a healthy diet, and a pleasant environment. Okay, so those are really what you need. If you're not getting enough sleep or good sleep, and I know those with young children, um, all I wanna say to you is, I know you're not getting enough sleep, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, you know, um, that's, that's really important. I remember, um, you know, having a client who was crying because she wasn't able to be as organized as she was before she had her children. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's normal. That's life. Cut yourself a little slack. It's okay. The important thing is that you're eating well, um, you're sleeping well, and, and, and everybody's healthy and happy. That's the important thing. And then move on to next. And yes, we need to be really good about setting boundaries. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard, um, you know, when there are so many demands on our time. Um, and and it's, it's really hard to say no, um, but you can do it. It does take practice. Um, and then, you know, what most people talk about when they talk about producti productivity, they're talking about the apps and automating and building systems. 
But if you are not getting good sleep, you're not eating well, and you're saying yes to everything and, and doing everything for everybody else, none of those details will make one bit of difference in helping you be productive. So take that into account. Take your family situation into account because, you know, um, if you're in a deployment situation, if you've just been posted or you're about to be posted and, um, you know, your, your psychology is a little um, stressed, uh, you're going to need some, some time. So do cut yourself some slack um, and, and look into some self-care before you try and go out and, and charge through everything that you need to do. So I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody's heard the Eisenhower important urgent principle. You know, there are things that are urgent and important and not urgent but important and not urgent or not important, so it's totally okay. I'm just going to drop everything and work on your problems, which is not important. Um, and that's, I think, uh, what we're referring to about personal boundaries. But part of that is time management as well. Um, so, you know, for me, I defined my urgent and important is somebody's not breathing and they should be, um, and somebody is, or somebody is oozing bodily fluids and they shouldn't be. So those are my urgent and important. Everything else is not important or not urgent. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, for example, um, a lot of people spend time with these urgent but not important things, um, but not enough time on the not urgent but important things, such as planning, development, prevention, making doctor's appointments, that sort of thing. So, you know, consider um, turning off the TV, um, turning off social media alerts, holding back on the gossip, and working on planning, prevention, and development. So now that we know that we're taking self-care and what we should be working on, let's take a look at some ways to get that done. Now, Einstein said, um, can I make a little box here? Einstein, yeah, there we go. Okay, um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. With a lot of families, I see them doing the thing differently over and over again and expecting the same result. And so it's time to develop some routines. So, uh, you know, for those of you in the Air Force, um, you know, pilots, they have their, um, you know, pre-flight checklists. Um, that's really important. Um, and, and that can be things like, you know, before you leave the house, you know, I'm looking, you know, you look in your diaper bag. Do you have A, B, C, and D? Yes, you do. Do you have your kids? Do you have this? Do you have that? You've checked off and, and then you can go out the door. Um, that's one type of a routine. Another type of a routine would be, you know, I make dinner. We eat dinner as a family. We clean up as a family and then we, you know, uh, do homework or whatever. And that goes on. And the benefits for, for children are, are good because they know what to expect and it's a, it's a comfort for them. Um, so um, that's, that's really important. Um, you can develop all sorts of your own routines, um, you know, doing the dishes routine, um, you know, going out of the house routine, coming back into the house routine, the laundry routine, um, Everything is a routine. And when you think of it, um, I, I was in the manufacturing industry, and you know, every piece of equipment you operate has a little standard operating procedure. You know, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. And when you start to develop all of the things you do in the house in a little routine, it's very easy for you to write it down and for somebody else to take over and do the job exactly the same as you do. Um, so for example, uh, you want to go, you know, you want to turn your laundry over to your 12-year-old. You know, you have the routine written out, you post it on the wall in front of the washing machine or beside the washing machine, um, you walk them through it two or three times, 
and pointing out each step on the routine, and they can do it. Don't let them tell you they can't, because if a 12-year-old can figure out how to do Minecraft, they can certainly use how to learn how to use a washing machine. So the next thing that can really help is theming. And I was introduced to this concept recently, and it really has helped me manage my time, especially working from home. Um, I have themed each day of my week. Uh, so, you know, for example, Monday is housework after everybody's tossed the house all over all weekend. Monday morning when everybody leaves, I do the housework and it's done. Um, Tuesday tends to be a very quiet day, um, but all my housework is done, so I've got a lot of time to work on a big project. Um, Thursday, you know, I was taking a class, so I dedicated that to learning. So those are things that you can think about to, to apply themes for your days, months, years, so that when you have free time on that day, you can think, oh, this is my learning day. Let me read a book in these 10 minutes that I've got free or half an hour that I've got free and learn you know, a new idea or a new skill. You can also theme your months. For example, I, I have my months themed January. I plan. That's, I plan out the rest of my year. I plan out my days. I plan out my projects. So everything I do um, in January is, is sort of under the arch of planning. February, I concentrate on relationships. So I will, you know, um, make some effort to reach out to people that I haven't spoken to in a long time, either on social media or with emails or with phone calls. And March, um, March, I focus on, let me go here, information, um, because I'm preparing my taxes. Um, then I will you know, all of my information, I'll review my retention schedule, I'll, I'll do my disposition, I'll move stuff from active to inactive. All of those things are what I focus on in March. It's not that I don't do that stuff at other times during the year, I, I do, but that's my main focus for March. And again, I also theme my years. I don't really pick a New Year's resolution. Um, I pick three words sometimes two, sometimes four, but usually three words for the year. So, um, you know, to, so I focus on those words. So 2018, my words are reduce, reuse, and recycle. So I'm going to think about how I can reduce, um, you know, uh, my purchases, um, you know, redu maybe reduce my spending. When I'm thinking about housework, reduce the time that I'm, I'm spending um, on the housework. Can I streamline it? Um, February relationships. Um, reduce the time in between uh, the time, you know, either I spend talking with people that are, you know, no longer in my life. Do I reduce the time between I talk to the people that are important? So do I, um, you know, reduce that um, information? Should I reduce the amount of paper? Do, is there anything I need to transport into something more electronic? Um, again, um, you know, recycling. Um, can I repurpose some clothes? Can I, um, you know, make the process of getting all of the cans and bottles out to my recycle bin easier? Um, those sorts of things, um, you know, uh, that's what my theme is going to be for 2018. So those are things that you can think about. Um, as you go forward. So I will also put a, a link on um, my website to productivity, um, and that's uh, on my website, so you can click and go through to there. So um, just so you can, it, can people just quickly give me a check mark if they're comfortable with PowerPoint, using PowerPoint? Okay, good. Um, also, on my website, uh, I put up a time blocking map. So this little block here, um, this little picture here uh, that I have up, um, you can actually move these little parts around in PowerPoint. And I don't do physical fitness seven days a week for two hours a day. I don't. Um, so 
there's a PowerPoint presentation that will allow you to script your day and put in time blocks to see where your time is going. So some common time management mistakes people make. There's no estimation of the time tasks. Um, they schedule an exact time. You really need to schedule a little bit more time before and after your activity for preparation. Another big one is um, no energy assigned to a task. Some tasks you need a, a lot of mental energy to do. For example, you remember a couple slides ago I showed you that Tuesday was my big project day. Well, Tuesday, I, I'm not going to work on that Monday. Monday is a day that you know nobody has any focus and you're just starting to get into your week. So for me to schedule my big project on Monday, I would not be very productive because I wouldn't be as mentally focused as I would be, for example, say, um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And Friday, you know, you're, you're thinking about the weekend and what you should do. So that is also not a good day for, for heavy focus work. So um, those, you know, maybe Monday I'm up and raring to get rested all weekend. I've got a lot of energy so I can get my house clean really fast and I can run my errands. So by assigning your tasks with an energy level, it will help you know when to schedule them. So, and um, I'm going to quickly let you look at this slide. Um, you know, there are a lot of good productivity tools out there. Um, you know, most people, I'll start here, they see this new productivity tool and they're like, oh yeah, this is really going to work for me, I love it, I love it, I love it, and then it's not working for me quite so much, and you know what, I really hate it, and it's not working, and it's not working, and they give it up at this point here. But what they need to do is keep working with it, and eventually they'll get the hang of it, and it will work for them. And that's when you start to see the tools used. So, um, I will put links to some of these productivity tools on my website, and you can uh, have a quick look through. Um, and then questions about your time. I'm sorry I had to rush through that. I know we're pushing two hours here, so if there are any questions on your time, please raise your hand, unmute yourself, and ask. What's the name of your website? Um, there, there's a lot of good information on unclutterer.com. Okay, then, so that's not your website, right? No, that's not my website. That's who I work for. Okay, um, well, because you you keep saying I'm going to put that on my website. So I, I was curious uh, if we can go see your website. Too. You will be taken to that as soon as this pro presentation is over. Okay. Okay. And you can and you can bookmark that as well. Fantastic, thank you. And and si tu as des questions en français, vous êtes bienvenue de de les poser. Um, mm. Dérange pas de répondre en français non plus. Ah, oh, vous avez un bel accent. <laughs> oui, un bel accent anglais. Je sais. Merci. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead actually and stop the recording now.